Good morning. There we go. All right. Hi, guys. How are we doing today? Ooh, great. Okay. Well, we are in our third week of a series called Honorable. So we've been talking about ways that we can use what we have, our words, our bodies, all things to honor God because he is worthy of our honor. So this message this week is titled Honor Part 3, Honorable Part 3, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Matthew 5, and we're going to be reading verses 33 through 37. If you don't have your Bible, no worries. It'll be on the screen behind me, so let's go ahead and read that together. It says this. This is Jesus talking. He says, You have also heard that our ancestors were told, You must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say, by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say, by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say, by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say, by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. So this kind of main point, main idea we're going to be talking about unpacking this morning is this. Jesus is pointing at the fact that we should have the kind of character that allows others to trust our simple yes and no answers. We should be reliable people who do what we say we're going to do and don't do what we say we will not do. There's no need to add I promise or swear on my life because a simple, our simple words hold enough weight so others can trust us because our actions speak louder than the words that we say. So a month ago, I guess, at this point, Andrew and I, my husband, we went on a trip, and this was a trip that we had talked about doing even before we got married. We were like, if we get married one day, this would be such a fun trip to do. We wanted to fly to the West Coast and rent a car and drive all the way down the coast of America, which we just thought would be so fun. Um, and it's something that we had talked about a lot for a couple years at this point, and we finally did it. We took the trip, guys, and it was great. Um, but to make this trip happen, a lot of planning had to go into it. So I don't know if any of y'all have done like a big road trip or anything like that, but it's kind of got a lot of moving parts to it. So like you'll fly somewhere, but then you have to figure out like all your stops, where you're going to stay, all the Airbnbs, the rental car, all the things. So it took a good month, few months of planning of what we were going to do, where we we're going to stay, all that kind of stuff. And the key piece to this trip was a rental car. It's a road trip. You gotta have a rental car. So Andrew was in charge of taking care of the rental car. So he did all of his research. He figured out what could we afford, what was kind of the cheaper route, what do we need to do about the rental car. And we settled on budget, which is like a rental car company, whatever. So this is like two months out from our trip. He rents the car. We pay for the car fully for the week that we're gonna have it. We pay for the whole car. They tell us we're gonna get a RAV4, which is like a Toyota or like similar-esque. If they don't have that one, they'll give us a different one. So that's kind of like the style of car we're going to get. We're excited about it. We're packing. We're getting ready to go. We fly. We land in Seattle, Washington. And the plan was fly to Seattle, rent the car, and then we're going to drive up and then down the coast of Oregon and then fly home out of Portland. So lots of driving, but lots of sights, lots of things to see, lots of things to do. So we were pumped. So our flight lands. It's like 10 p.m. It's late. If you have ever traveled late, you know that it can be kind of a beast sometimes. You land. You're tired. You still got to get your bags, and then you got to get your Airbnb, and then the next day we're about to start driving on this road trip that we're going to be on for the next week. So lots of driving, lots of things to look forward to, but it's also going to be like a little tiring. So we're a little tired, and we land, we get our bags, and we have to shuttle from where we pick up our bags to this building that has all of the rental car places. So we get on the shuttle, we go over to the rental car area, and we walk in this building, and it's basically just a line of all of the different rental car companies. So you've got got Avis, Hertz, Dollar, Budget, all of the rental cars lined up and all these people that got off our bus all get into the budget line. So there's like no lines, but the budget line is long. There's probably like 50, 60 people in this line. So we're like, oh gosh, this is going to take forever. It's okay. Like we're almost close to our Airbnb. Like we're going to go to bed. This is going to be fine. Like we'll get it. And so we're in this line. We're waiting for about 10, 15 minutes. And this guy in like budget official attire comes out and he points to sort of the front of the line and he says, okay, everybody from here back, I'm so sorry, but we're not gonna have a car for you. 
And me and Andrew were like, no car for our road trip that we planned months in advance. A car that we paid for, that they said they were gonna have for us, they don't have it. So the guy's like, I'm so sorry, we're not gonna have the car for you. Um, it's like 11.30 at this point. All these other places, they usually stay open to about midnight, so you've got like maybe 15, 20 minutes to go find a car somewhere else. So all of these 50, 60 people disperse, and it's like crazy town. Everybody's running to the different rental car companies. Andrew and I decide we're gonna split up. I go to one rental car place, and the guy in front of me gets their last car, no luck. Andrew goes to another place. It's way out of our budget. We can't do it. Finally, we find a place that they hear our story. They're like, we're so sorry that happened. We'll work with you. We get a car. So don't worry, guys. Road trip saved. We took the road trip. It was great. We had a truck, which was not what we planned to have, but Andrew ended up loving driving the truck. So that was great. But so rude of budget to promise us a car. And then we get there and there's no car. I mean, for our little road trip, and I don't even know the story of all the other people in line in front of us. I don't know if they got a car or what the deal was, but we paid them and everything. They said they had a car for us, and even though they knew they were overbooked, you know how many cars you have, you know how many you're promising out to people, they still promised us a car, did not deliver, and it was almost really bad for us. It was like, do we literally have to fly home? Because like, we gotta have a car for this trip. But it ended up working out, thankfully. But budget did not do what they said they were going to do. And in our lives, there are sometimes things that we say we're going to do that we have no intention of following through on. Things that we say we're going to do that we don't end up doing. Maybe you promised your friends this week, this is the week I'm going to make it to live, knowing full well I'm skipping. I'm staying home. I'm doing my homework. I'm doing whatever else I have to do. You tell your friend, hey, you can trust me. I, I want to be there for you. Tell me what's going on in your life. I won't tell anybody. Then you go around and gossip about it anyways. You tell a girl or a guy that's interested in you things that aren't true to keep them stringing along, to keep them interested in you, even though you know full well this isn't going anywhere. You commit to a team, but once the season gets hard, once it gets going, once it's not as fun anymore, you decide, eh, I don't think this is for me, and you quit, and you back out of the commitment you made to a team that you're on. Or maybe you tell God, Lord, I want a closer relationship with you, I want to grow my faith, but your actions say otherwise. And some of these things may seem small, inconsequential, not that big of a deal, but when you start compromising on the small things, it makes it way easier to compromise on the big things. And as Christ followers, we should be people who honor others in everything we do, including what we say, which is what Matthew's talking about in these verses. So to give you a little bit of context about what's going on, Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. So this is Jesus, and he's giving a lot of teachings. He's teaching a lot of different things, a lot of things you may have heard of before. He talks about being the salt and light of the earth. He talks about loving your enemies. And the whole point of these teachings that he's giving is they're really going against what the culture would have said to do at that time. He's speaking to Jewish people, Jewish leaders who have an idea of what they think is right, but totally flipping it on its head. Don't just love the people that are easy to love, love your enemies. If you hate somebody that's just as bad as murdering them, don't do that. He's taking these teachings that people knew of and taking it a step further, and that's what he's doing in these verses, talking about oaths. So to give you some context, kind of understand why this is so important at this time, we see in the Old Testament, God made promises to the Israelites. He made promises to his people. People would make promises to God. People would make promises to each other with God in mind. And if you made a promise to somebody with the Lord, swearing to God that you were going to do something, it was binding. You had to do it. Like there was nothing that was going to break that promise. It was going to happen because you're swearing by God. Like that's a big deal. And so it was a very, very big deal. So what was happening at this time was there were these Jewish leaders who knew this to be true. They knew oaths were a big part of the culture. We promise people each other. We say we're going to have this deal and you can trust me, all these things. But instead of swearing on God, they would swear by, like the verse said, by Jerusalem, swear by the earth, swear by heaven. And then the people would come to them and be like, hey, like you promised you're going to do this or that. Oh, well, I didn't swear by God. So like, it's not that big of a deal, like, I'm not going to do it. So, like, you know when you were five and you would tell somebody you're going to do something, but, like, you had your fingers crossed behind your back? It was kind of like that, like, super lame. They were totally just kind of just warping this idea of making a promise just so they did not have to do what they said they were going to do, which is why Jesus is talking about it. He says, hey, none of that. We're not going to do that. In fact, just don't even make oaths. Just let your yes be yes, your no be no. Just say what you mean and mean what you say is basically what he is saying. So 
The Sermon on the Mount, he's talking about how to live in the culture then, but it can still apply to us today. So let's talk about how. So I've got three points for you. We're going to talk about mean what you say, when. When should we mean what we say? Lots of different areas. We're going to talk about three today. The first one, mean what you say when you talk to other people. As Christ followers, we are to share Jesus with everyone by our actions and our words. If you're someone who is unreliable, can't be counted on, known for little white lies they tell here and there, what does that say about your character? What does that say about your integrity? That if I'm somebody who's trying to proclaim the gospel to other people, but I can't be trusted, no one wants anything to do with any sort of gospel I have to offer them, right? Like, they don't want to be associated with that. You know people in your life like this, right? People who say they're going to do something, they say they're going to show up, but they never do. They're always flaking out on you. They maybe tell little white lies all the time. Like, that's not somebody you can trust. That's not somebody that you want to be around. And character is so important when it comes to sharing Jesus. And it's not that you have to be perfect, right? Nobody's perfect in any area, especially this one, but we should be striving to look more like Christ. And he was someone who always did what he said he was going to do. So when you talk to others, just say what you mean and let that be it. And when you add, I promise or swear on my life, you're admitting that your usual speech can't be trusted. It's like, oh, well, you didn't promise, you must not mean it. No, I do mean it because I say what I mean, and you can count on that. Like the verse says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't overcomplicate it. Just do what you say you're going to do. That's the first one. We have to mean what we say when we talk to others. The second one is mean what you say when you talk to yourself. Mean what you say when you talk to yourself, and if you talk to yourself out loud, that's fine, no judgment here, but I mainly mean like your thoughts. Mean what you say up here, because our thoughts have to be reliable. If we can't be reliable in our own heads, that's kind of a big issue, right? Like we have to be able to rely on the things that we're thinking, but once we start letting lies and excuses in, it's a slippery slope that leads to more excuses and compromises. We say, oh, well, what I'm doing isn't as bad as what this person is doing, or oh, I can stop this thing whenever I want. It's not really that big of a deal. Those are lies, those are excuses that enter in. And that verse, that last part, it says, whenever we do this, evil enters. That's when the enemy gets a foothold in our life to encourage us to compromise on more things, right? Like I said at the beginning, when you start compromising on the small things, it makes it easier to compromise on the big things. And you're doing yourself no favor when you're not honest with yourself. Because when you're honest with yourself, that's where real life change can happen. So you have to be real with yourself. Mean what you say in your thoughts. Don't let yourself get away with excuses or lies to tell yourself to make yourself feel better about something because that's not helping anybody. So you got to be real with yourself. Mean what you say when you talk to yourself. And the last one is you got to mean what you say when you talk to God. Mean what you say when you talk to God. Because first off, he already knows it. He already knows everything you're thinking, everything you're saying, everything you do or you're going to do. He knows literally every single thing. Yet we still find ourselves trying to hide stuff from him. We still find ourselves nervous to tell him something. Don't be nervous about it. He already knows about it anyways. So why does he even ask us to do this? Because if he is God, all-powerful, big, vast, all-knowing, he seems like this super big thing, which he is, but he's also God, personal, close to me, wants a relationship with me, wants to help me with the things that I'm going through. And that's why he asks us to share with him those things. Even though he already knows it, it's not for him to be in the know, but it's for us to let him in to help us with whatever it is that we are going through. I have had a prayer journal for years. Like I've been journaling my prayers since, gosh, like sixth grade probably. And if you don't do it, you should because one, it's super hilarious to go back and see the things that you thought you really wanted when you were in sixth grade. Um, But two, it helped me kind of put in perspective like what prayer should look like. I remember I would try to find like the cutest journal. I wanted like the best like sparkly gel pens. Like I wanted it to look very pretty. I wanted my words to sound very flowy. I wouldn't write for a while until I thought what like sounds the best because I wanted it to look a certain way or whatever. I wanted it to sound flowy and pretty. But that's not real. Like the, that's not the way people talk. And the way you normally talk is the way that you should be talking to God. If you want a lesson in prayer right now, here you go. Talk like you normally talk. Because God loves 
the real you, not the you that you pretend to be. He loves the real you, not the you that you put the mask on, that you want these flowy, pretty words to be able to say whatever it is you think you need to say to God. Say what you mean. And that includes all your thoughts, all your feelings, when you're doubting, whenever you're angry at God, whenever you don't understand, go to him with those things. Be real with him. Because it's only when we do that he can come in and help us. So that's my encouragement to you, is that if you don't already do that in your prayer life, be real with him. Because he already knows it. And it helps nobody if we're just fake with God. It helps nobody. So we're about to head into small groups, and I want you to talk about a time someone did not keep their word to you. Somebody didn't do something they said they were going to do. They said something to you that they didn't mean. Talk about a time that happened, and what was the effect of that? What was the outcome? And unfortunately, the reality is, is that people are going to break their promises to you. People are, are going to fall through. They're not going to do what they say they're going to do. You're going to have a parent who promises to be there but consistently fails to show up. A friend that says they're going to make changes to improve your relationship but never does. Even ourselves, we say we're going to give up this habit. We're going to change this about ourselves. We constantly fail ourselves over and over again. People are going to let you down. You'll let yourself down. But the good news is, is that there's someone who will never let you down, and that's God who loves you so much, sent Jesus to come, die on the cross for your sins. You got a relationship with him and spent eternity in heaven with him forever. That's something that you've never um, done before. You've never made a commitment in your life to follow him. You could do that today. So if you have questions about that, talk to your small group leader. Come talk to me. Some of our staff would love to have a conversation with you. And I just want to throw up that QR code again for Fall Riot registration because, you know, talking about your commitment. Like, who do I want to be? I want to be somebody who chases after the Lord. I want to be somebody who helps bring others along with me in chasing after the Lord. This is a great way to do it, okay? If you didn't hear Caden earlier, we're having fall riot. It's going to be November 8th downstairs in the worship center. We did dodgeball last year. It was a hit, so we're doing it again. Um, we're going to have insane prizes. It's going to be a fun night. If you're not on a dodgeball team, if you have no desire to play dodgeball, still use this code to register. There's a two-part registration process. If you're not playing dodgeball and if you are playing dodgeball, it gets you to enter into a shoe giveaway no matter if you're playing or not. So everybody who wants to walk in the door should register. So save this link, send it to your friends, because the goal is not just to have a fun night to play dodgeball, but it's to share the gospel with people who need to hear it. So that's my challenge for you guys. We'd love to see y'all this Wednesday. Start bringing your friends now, even before Fall Riot. And we'll leave this up for a few minutes. And during small group, you need to scan it some more. But let's pray, and then let's head into groups.